Hello and welcome to uh, our midweek Bible study uh, as we again continue our series through the Psalms as we consider Psalm 17. But before we turn to God's word, let us first turn to God in prayer. Uh, let us pray. Father God, again we thank you for this opportunity to gather and to hear you speak to us. We praise you because you are not a distant God uninterested in the affairs of your people but a devoted and loving God who faithfully cares for uh, the, your people in every way. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness and your goodness to us in sending Jesus to rescue us. And we thank you, Father, for your word, which tells the grand story of how you've always loved and cherished your people and done everything to rescue us and draw us to yourself. Father, as we open up your word, we pray that the same spirit who authored it would also open up our hearts and minds to receive your truth, uh, to love you more and to live for you day by day. Father, please be with us now and bless our time for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. And so we turn to Psalm 17 uh, and Psalm 17 naturally follows from Psalm 15 and, then, and Psalm 16, which Albert considered the last time. There are similar themes in, in all three of these Psalms. David comes to God in a time of personal need uh, to bring to him and to share with him his problem and to seek God's help. So Psalm 17 is another Psalm, another prayer of lament. David is calling on God in need and trusting in God to help him. To David, God is a refuge and a vindicator, a righteous judge and a loving friend who will always do right by those he loves. In this psalm, we see that David's desire is that God would rise up and do what is right for his people. And so we have here a model prayer for God's people uh, when they face injustice and feel helpless. So let us read it together. Psalm 17, a prayer of David, and it begins like this. Hear me, Lord, my plea is just. Listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. It does not rise from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. Though you probe my heart, though you examine me at night and test me, you will find that I have planned no evil. My mouth has not transgressed. Though people try to bribe me, I have kept myself from the ways of the violent through what your lips have commanded. My steps have held to your paths, my feet have not stumbled. I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. Show me the wonders of your great love, you who save by your right hand those who take refuge in, in you from their foes. Keep me as the apple of your eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings, from the wicked who are out to destroy me, from my mortal enemies who surround me. They close up their callous hearts, and their mouths speak with arrogance. They have tracked me down. They now surround me, with eyes alert to throw me to the ground. They are like a lion hungry for prey, like a fierce lion crouching in cover. Rise up, Lord. Confront them. Bring them down. With your sword, rescue me from the wicked. By your hand, save me from such people, Lord, from those of this world whose reward is in this life. May what you have stored up for the wicked fill their bellies. May their children gorge themselves on it. And may there be leftovers for their little ones. As for me, I will be vindicated and will see your face. When I awake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. And we thank God for this reading of his word. So imagine for a moment, will you, this scenario. You've worked in your current place of employment for several years years, and you get on well with your colleagues and senior staff. People are aware of your Christian faith and so far it hasn't really caused a problem. However, one day you're asked to do something which you consider inappropriate, dishonest even. You gently refuse to go along with the request and nothing more is said at the time. However, the next day you find that you've been suspended from work and accused of the very wrongdoing that you actually refused to take to be part of. You'll be called in to give your side of the story in one week's time. What would you do in a situation like that? How would you feel? What would you do? How would you respond? We do not know the exact circumstances of Psalm 17. However, from the opening verses, we can assume that it's in response to false accusations of wrongdoing. In response, 
David cries out to God in prayer. Psalm 17 is a lament, calling on God to help in the midst of trouble perpetrated by unnamed enemies. In many ways, Psalm 17 is a model prayer for us as believers whenever we face injustice, whenever we face uh, unfair accusations. It is urgent, perceptive, honest and moving. David appeals to God and he argues his case, explaining why God should listen to him and do what is right. In the psalm we see that David has a righteous cause in verses 1 to 5, that he has a faithful God in verses 6 to 12, and he has an eternal hope in verses 13 to 15. David confidently appeals to God with, as the eternal vindicator and the refuge of his people. As God's people today, we will increasingly be on the receiving end of injustice for our faith when we take a stand on a range of issues, when we take a stand for God's truth in all manner of, of, of uh, issues surrounding us. When we face opposition and accusation, let us be a people who come to God first, come to him, come to the one who graciously receives us as his people in the name of Jesus and gives us grace to sustain us in the fight. So let's first of all turn to a righteous cause in verses 1 to 5. We see that David has a righteous cause in verses 1 to 5. Uh, a while back uh, I was watching a programme uh, and it showed a, a clip of two people arguing uh, very even aggressively towards each other. They were friends but they were arguing their case. Both sides believed that they were in the right. Something had happened and that, that they, were, they were on the right side of, of, of this issue. Um, and then a third friend interjected, he, he came along uh, and he'd actually recorded the incident and he showed the video to both parties. They watched the video and eventually one agreed that, that they were in the wrong and that justice was done. Um, an outside source had to come in and show what had actually happened and what was actually the cause of, of right. And in the opening verses of Psalm 17, we see David's appeal to God to be that judge, to listen and to act for him in the situation he faces. He wants God to interject, to, to be the one who does what is right. David has been wronged and he wants God to put things right. And so in verses 1 to 2, we read, Hear me, Lord, my plea is just. Listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. It does not arise from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from you. May your eyes see what is right. In a manner that is typical of the Lament Psalms, David begins with a series of pleas for help. Hear me. Listen to my cry. Hear my prayer. This is a passionate appeal by David to his God. David approaches God in, a, in distress, but with confidence, seeking God's help. Why does he believe that God should hear him and respond to him? Well, in these opening verses, we see that David seeks vindication and examination. Firstly, in verses 1 to 2, we see David cry out to God for vindication. David does not believe that he deserves what is happening to him. He is on the wrong side of this incident. And so he calls on God, the righteous one, the judge, to judge between himself and his accusers. David is not asking God to commit an injustice. David has been wronged and he's asking God to do what is right. David believes that God should listen because his cause is just and there is no deceit in his words. In these verses we see that David, uh, see David claim his life is above reproach. David, pay, David prays as an innocent person who has searched his heart. His prayer comes from a sincere heart seeking God's righteousness and God's way in all things. I wonder when you and I come to God in prayer, do we examine ourselves? We need to examine what we are asking for and the motives behind our request. Before we ever utter a word to God in prayer, we must spend time meditating on God's word and God's truth and applying his truth to our hearts. We need to ask, is what I'm asking God for something that is against God's law, against God's will? Is my prayer out of anger or selfishness or jealousy or frustration that is, that is misguided? Am I asking God to help me sin? Am I asking God to help my sinful ways prosper rather than seeking to, to put my will under God's will? 
we need to be able to say with David, hear a just cause, O Lord. We not need to make sure that our cause that we bring before God is just and right because we've searched our hearts and put our hearts under the truth of God's law. And notice in verses 3 to 5 how David seeks God's examination of his heart. David's cause, his appeal for justice is righteous because David didn't just say he was innocent. Instead, David seeks God's thorough and intensive examination of the deepest concerns and deepest corners of his heart. Here we see David welcomes God's probing of his heart. His thoughts and motives as well as, as his actions are all put under the spotlight of God's judgment. David has resolved to live a righteous life for God in every way. He has committed his way to the Lord. David has paid careful attention to living a life which honours God in every aspect, even in the company that he keeps. David has searched his own heart and sought to live a life of integrity. There is no pretense in his piety. David has nothing to hide. He has sought God and to live for God in every way possible. The underlying principle is that God notices the life of a person who comes to him in prayer. As James says in verse 16 of chapter 5 of his epistle, the prayer of a righteous person has great power. So we need to examine ourselves when we come to God. We need to think about what, who we are and, and the reality of our righteousness. We need to consider, am I coming to God with a just cause? Am I being honest with God? Is there sincerity in my appeal or is there hypocrisy? Is there a known sin in my life that I need to confess before I bring anything else to God? Do I need to confess sin and have God deal with it before I make any requests of him? David appealed to God on the basis of his innocence. And so, and in so doing, David points us all to Christ. Only Christ can truly say, you have tested me and you will find nothing. Only Christ is truly righteous and it's only through him that we can come to God in prayer. Jesus, in his perfect life, sacrificial death and justifying resurrection, opened the way to the throne of God so that we can bring our prayers to him and be heard by God. In fact, now in heaven, Christ prays for us and his spirit intercedes on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. Believers, we can be bold in prayer because we have one pleading our case before God, the righteous judge, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. God hears his prayers and so he hears our prayers too. He cares for us because he is a faithful God. And we see that David has a faithful God in verses 6 to 12. David has appealed to God as the perfect righteous judge. David desired that God would do what is right. Now David comes to plead with God as a friend and a protector. David appeals to God on the basis of God's love for his people. Notice his great declaration of faith in the second part of his prayer. In verse 6 we read these words. I call on you, my God, for you will answer me. Turn your ear to me and hear my prayer. How could God be, how could David be sure that God would hear and answer him? We know that David believed in the rightness of his cause and the righteousness of his life. However, his faith was not in himself, but in his faithful God. In the ESV, verses 7 to 9 are translated like this. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Saviour of those who seek refuge, from the adversaries at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. Here is a prayer thick with covenant language and words of devotion about a faithful and loving God who will do all in his infinite power to keep his beloved people. The God to whom David cries is not a distant, disinterested deity. Rather, he is one who is devoted to his people, as a husband is devoted to his wife. The steadfast love of God speaks of how he has pledged himself to his people. He will love them, be faithful to them, care for them. He will deliver them and remain with them now and always. 
David knows that God will be faithful to his people because he always has been. From the freeing of his people from slavery in Egypt to the dwelling with them in the wilderness to his giving them a land of their own, God has always acted on behalf of his people for his glory. The God who David appeals to is willing and able to keep all his promises to his people all the time. He is a refuge to his people. He keeps them by his stirring, strong and mighty right hand. No harm will ever ultimately come to God's people. David here is appealing to the eternal character of God as a covenant making and a covenant keeping God. When God commits himself to his people, he will do all in his power to keep his word. The almighty God will use all in his power to keep his word to his people. And as God's people today, we look to the cross and we know that God keeps all his promises in Christ. In Christ, God displays his glory in his utter devotion to his people, in the sending of his son, his only son, his beloved son. And in verse 8, we learn not only that God is a faithful spouse who keeps his promises, but he is also a loving parent who faithfully protects his people. The phrase apple of your eye literally means the, the little man of the eye. And it refers to that tiny reflection of yourself that you see in, in the other person's pupil whenever you're staring right at them. God looks us straight in the face. He, he looks at us. He gazes upon us. To be the apple of someone's eye clearly means that you are being gazed upon and watched closely by a person who loves you and dev is devoted to you. So when David asked God to keep me, keep me as the apple of your eye, he was asking God to regard him as one, as one would a cherished child, the object of great affection. God's loving gaze was upon David. God's lo loving gaze is always upon his people. And because he was the apple of God's eye, David also asked God for his protection. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. The image here is of a mother bird who protects her little children, her young, by covering them with her wings. She will not allow anything to happen to them. She will even bear the burden for her children to protect them from the enemies. David was seeking shelter in God from those who were out to destroy him from his mortal enemies who were surrounding him and seeking his destruction. David's confidence in God's faithfulness comes e becomes even more clear when we see the danger that he faced. In verses 10 to 12 we read that the enemies of God's people are described as those with hard and proud hearts who seek selfish ends at the expense of those around them, especially God's people. They are cruel and ruthless predators who seek the destruction of their prey. These enemies are dangerous and provide a substantial threat to God's people. It's one thing to trust God when the sun is shining and when all is okay. But the storms reveal the strength of our faith. David trusted in God's enduring love and loyalty when he was surrounded by real violence, by real threats to his very life. We must not be surprised when we face opposition, but rather count it as a pure joy, as James says. Opposition and, and suffering lead us to cry out to God in prayer and seek God in his ways. Opposition is evidence that we are on the side of God fighting his cause and we should embrace it as his people. And so in our prayers, we do come to a powerful God, a loving God, a faithful God. But do we really? Do we really believe that our God is powerful, loving and faithful? Is our trust completely in God and his perfect purposes, his promises and his plans? Before, during and after our prayers, we take time. We must take time not just to search our hearts, but also to remind ourselves of the one that we come to. The one, the one that we come to, come to in praise and in petition. Our prayers, indeed our whole lives, must flow from a deepening understanding of who God is and what he has done for his people and what he continues to do for us and through us in Christ. He is a faithful God who provides an eternal hope. And so we see that eternal hope that David has and God's people have in verses 13 to 15. David ends this psalm by appealing to God on the basis of his own love for God. 
The final verses draw a contrast between David and his enemies. His enemies are worldly. Their hearts love this created world, but God loves the creator. Their portion is in this life, while David will not be satisfied with anything else or anything less than seeing God in the world to come. They are focused selfishly on the gifts that God gives. David loves the giver. The wicked love the, this present world and David asks God to rebuke them. In verses 13 to 14, David pens these profound and penetrating words. He says, rise up, Lord, confront them, bring them down with your sword. Rescue me from the wicked. By your hand, save me from such people, Lord, from those who this world, from those of this world whose reward is in this life. May what you've stored up for the wicked fill their bellies. May their children gorge themselves on it. And may, they be, may there be leftovers for their little ones. David's enemies are those of this world. They are focused on this world and the temporary rewards it has to offer. Here we are warned about the dangers of living a worldly existence, of putting our hope in the temporary things of this world. If you are worldly, you're, you love this present life and you're not looking to the world to come. You love the gifts that God gives your children, your inheritance, the things that you can pass down to them, but you do not love God. In fact, you take his generosity for granted. David talks about outward blessings, but his focus is also internal. Since their portion is in this life, the worldly measure everything by what, by what there is here and now. Does it make me popular? Will I earn profit now? Does it give me power now? Does it give me instant gratification? Does it make me feel good about myself right now? This is how the worldly measure what happens to them in this world. So worldliness is not just about outward behaviour. Outward behaviour can be evidence of inner worldliness, but the real location of worldliness is internal. It is in our hearts. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Worldliness is much more penetrating than simple rules for behaviour. The essence of worldliness is what we love, our desires and our pride, the things that motivate us. We can be worldly by following a strict set of rules or by throwing the rules out the window. What makes someone worldly is what is the, that they, they live for approval, for respect, for status, for money, for pleasure, for security here and now in this world. And they are not looking for the world to come. Their focus is solely on what happens here and now and what they can get out of life now. And this way of life is in stark contrast to the life David pursues and calls believers to pursue. David's portion is not in this life. Instead, God is his reward. Not the things that God gives, but God himself. He is not in love with the crea this creation. He loves the creator. In Psalm 17, he ends up by saying, As for me, I will be vindicated. I will see your face. And when I wake, I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. Nothing on earth can satisfy the heart of a man or woman who truly loves God. Nothing can compare with the beauty and glory of Jesus Christ. The phrase, when I wake, probably refers to the resurrection of the dead, when we will see Jesus face to face. If you love God, you have a gnawing sense of homesickness wherever you go in this world. The most beautiful rainbow reminds you of someone more beautiful you're waiting to see. The most majestic mountains remind you of a greater majesty to come. You will not be satisfied by anything less than seeing the face of God. As C.S. Lewis reminds us, as sinners, we are too easily satisfied with lesser things. But as believers, we are to be satisfied only with the glory of God, both here and now as we live it out and seek it, and ultimately when we gaze upon it in glory. David closes his prayer, this appeal to God uh, to hear his prayer with a, with a declaration of his genuine love for God himself. As believers, we must be people who love God and find satisfaction and joy in him and in him alone. Our every thought and word and deed must be taken up with thinking of him and thanking him. To live truly is Christ. So Psalm 17 
is a perfect example of a lament that calls on God for help in the midst of opposition and attack because we followed God and his ways. David, after searching his heart and his conduct, knows that he does not deserve this ill treatment. David's cause is righteous and so he pursues righteousness by appealing to God for vindication. He also turns to his faithful God for refuge in this time of harassment by vicious enemies. This psalm is a model prayer for those who suffer for no apparent cause, particularly those who are harassed and persecuted by others for the cause of Christ. The psalm ends with a confident hope that the psalmist will be vindicated and will come into the very presence of God and will dwell with him forever. In Christ, God's people today can endure many trials with eternal hope. We can turn to God because in Christ we are made righteous and are being made fully righteous. We can turn to God because in Christ we see that God has kept all his promises and that he has made to his people and he will keep them forever. He will keep us, keep us his people forever. And we can turn to God because the riches of this world do not compare to the wealth that we have in Christ in eternity. Let us be a people who always turn to our faithful God and pursue righteousness with eternal hope. Let us pray. Father God, we once again thank you for your word and the truth that it contains, the great hope that we have in Christ as our righteousness. We have a strong, a perfect plea before the throne of glory. Before you, Father, we come as children who are dearly loved and protected. We thank you for the many blessings that we have in these days. And so, Father, we pray that you would give us renewed hope and confidence in who you are and what you've done for us so that we can live for you in every, every way possible and every day that you give to us. Father, please continue with us now as we come to you in prayer. Father, would you guide our prayer time and would you guide us in our prayers day by day that we would seek your glory as we search our hearts and search your truth. Continue with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you for joining with us this evening uh, and we hope that you'll be able now to join us as we turn to God in prayer at our prayer time. If you need help accessing Zoom, please contact Albert. He'd be glad to help you. He'll give you the details on, on how to access Zoom, but we'd love to see you there. So until then, take care uh, and God bless.